Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to the Dark Crystal Conjunction. Today, we're going to be looking at the composer of the Dark Crystal's wonderful music, Trevor Jones. A couple of weeks ago, whilst giving my review of the Dark Crystal Deluxe vinyl soundtrack, I pointed out that the booklet had a good little bio and interview with the composer, Trevor Jones. It wasn't until I read those couple of pages that I gained a much greater appreciation for Trevor Jones and how he went about scoring the Dark Crystal. I figured other Dark Crystal fans may have a similar experience to mine, thus this video. So in today's episode, I compiled a couple of video interviews about Trevor Jones' life in general. Then in our next video, we will look more at how he went about scoring the Dark Crystal from an interview that took place in the early 80s. So now let's look at the life of Trevor Jones, beginning with a clip from a morning show from his hometown that used the same bio found in the Dark Crystal album that I reviewed a couple weeks ago, which is the same bio from his website. The quality of the clip isn't the best, but it is a good compilation nonetheless. And after that first clip, I have a couple more clips about his life and legacy thus far. At 17, Trevor Jones left South Africa to attend the Royal Academy of Music in London, where he studied composition, orchestration, conducting, piano and organ. Having completed his studies, he worked at the BBC as a classical music reviewer. He continued his graduate studies at York University in England, before becoming the first composer to attend the National Film School in England. He graduated from the National Film School having completed 23 student film scores, and studying production, direction, sound, cinematography, and editing. Trevor Jones has composed over a hundred projects for film and television. They include Excalibur, The Dark Crystal, Runaway Train, Angel Heart, Mississippi Burning, Last of the Mohicans, Cliffhanger, Arachnophobia, In the Name of the Father, Richard III, Brassed Off, Dark City, and Notting Hill, amongst many, many others. Through these films, he has worked with film directing royalty, including Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Sir Ridley Scott, and Sir Alan Parker. He's also collaborated with David Bowie, Sting, U2, Sinead O'Connor, Charlotte Church, Britney Spears, and Elvis Costello, and has been a jury member for BAFTA and the Mercury Music Prize. He has founded a scholarship for South African students to attend the National Film and Television School in England and together with Trevor Jones's composition studio at the University of York is further testament to his commitment to fostering the next generation of composers, musicians and filmmakers. He I tend to write for big orchestral, symphonic orchestral sounds basically because I think they, they don't age the film as much as, you know, uh, synthesizers do. There is some electronics, but they gain, they're, they're there to extend the orchestral palette. They're not in the score for their own sake. Synthesizers come and go, you can listen to scores and, and you know that they spell out, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, and, and they tend to age a film, they, they tend to date films, whereas the big symphonic scores technically sit behind the picture very much more effectively, I think. You can, you can have a great big orchestral texture and lots of dialogue without it clashing. The, the orchestra is enormous. It's a huge 90-piece orchestra, especially throughout the film. And there is, as I say, you know, a fair bit of electronic fusion, but not so as you'd notice. Part of the magic for me is trying to get an audience into the world where one believes that dinosaurs speak um, and that one can have communication with these uh, rather superb animals and that, that they, they have a sensitivity and an emotion which one really isn't used to associating with, with huge sort of Tyrannosaurus rexes or, or a Pteranodon or, you know, any of these massive... Um, sort of dinosaurs, it's not, they're, they're not the sort of creatures one usually finds cuddly and, and indeed intelligent. So part of the job and the role of the music is to try and, and get the audience into a state of believing this world, a state of falling in love with this world. And it, it is a beautiful uh, visual world that has been created at great cost. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and it, it looks absolutely stunning. The 
the end of the day, uh, one's trying to imbue images with an emotionality. You're trying to bring out the meaning of the film. You're the voice in the ear of the audience. You say what they're meant to be feeling about a scene. And it's very challenging in that respect because the way one manipulates an audience's emotions is quite uh, uh, an art form, you know. That's the craft of scoring pictures. It's like a giant tapestry. One has to weave one's way through the, the picture. Uh, they, they're very essential to confirm in the minds of the audience where they are emotionally and they're the kind of tags, they're labels, they identify characters, they identify places. What you're doing is making people feel and respond to, uh, to images in a particular way. And uh, using the various parameters of music, you, you can do this with rhythm, with harmony, with melody and so on. You, you can actually manipulate an audience's responses. Music, it bypasses the intellect, it goes straight to the heart, it, it addresses the emotions. It's something that uh, is an essential element, thank heavens, to filmmaking because it's something that people don't really take on board when they're watching to a great extent. It works in a very subtle and, and uh, subliminal way. In terms of influences and composers, I think people like the Middle European composers, um, um, you know, Korngold and, and the swashbuckling mega scores of, of the 30s and 40s, those composers are, are really absolutely wonderful. I do love the Bernard Herrmann scores for the Hitchcock films and, and other scores of his too. It was Gulliver's Travels which started it, and then I went on to score Merlin and more recently Cleopatra. Hi. Hi. When you've got Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts in the classic Notting Hill, they meet. It's love at first sight. They break up and make up. And end up in love. It's the music that gives the final romantic touch, a score so subtle, so ethereal, its effect is unconscious. Music's quite extraordinary. You know, it's, it's an art form that runs um, concurrently with, with images. They both run in a continuum. And when the two are, interact, they, they, they set up a, it's like a, a third thing that happens. Trevor Jones is a master of this sort of emotional manipulation. You can make an audience feel very sad by writing very sad music, but you can also make an audience feel intensely even more sad by writing very violent music. I put my perspective on, on somebody else's vision. As a world-class composer, Trevor's scores have backed major Hollywood blockbusters. From the soaring theme of Last of the Mohicans, the human drama in the name of the father. While in Mississippi burning, the mood was relentlessly tense. Trevor, they say that you're the master of the suspenseful note. <laughs> uh, well, that's very kind of them. Trevor's modesty is extraordinary when you find out how far he's come in his 56 years. He was born in Cape Town and grew up in the ghetto of what was District 6. In apartheid South Africa, Trevor was just another colored boy. Those early years um, have very sort of bittersweet memories for me. Were drugs and uh, gangs prevalent in those days? But, well, District 6 was notorious, you know. There, there were lots of scollies, as they were known, and, you know, blood on the streets, literally, in the morning, on the way to school. 
I remember having to pay one of the bigger chaps in my class to kind of protect me from one or two of the scullies who would attack you. And it was pretty ghastly. I hated it. And being um, a hypersensitive kid, I was always sort of wandering around the school grounds at the yard, uh, humming Schubert 8 for some reason. I still remember this. So really, Trevor, music was your escape. Music was my escape and so was film. Trevor was only five years old when he started his love affair with film. At school he would play truant and was a regular at the local movie house. The projectionist would actually sit there with these, uh, I'm sure he was drunk most of the time, and the rods would burn down and so the image would fade and you just hear the, the soundtrack. But I noticed this relationship between image and sound. I was very aware of that. I was very conscious of the fact that music had uh, an effect on me as an audience and I was very sensitive to that at a very early age. And I remember saying to my mother, I'd love to uh, write music for film. So at five or six, you knew exactly what you wanted to do? Easily, at uh, that age, yes. Trevor's mother was a machinist at Rex Trueform. She couldn't afford to school her three boys. But luckily, Trevor got a scholarship to high school. Trevor, can you give me a, a quick lesson in composing for movies? Um, well, I, I do a quick lesson in how to write a piece. I mean, basically, uh, you take a series of notes. It was his grandmother who bought a piano on HP, and Trevor was in heaven. You could add harmonies. At 17, Trevor was auditioned for a scholarship to the prestigious British Royal Academy of Music. Uh, then you should change it about stylistically, so it becomes... He got the scholarship, said goodbye to his family. Setting off on a ship to, to a new life. I remember getting on the ship and meeting the two chaps I was sharing the cabin with uh, and them saying, now you see this piece of paper, we had to sign this saying we'd share the cabin with a, with a non-white, but uh, we, we don't mind you being a non-white, they said, but we don't want you in the cabin. Uh, purely because we have girlfriends <laughs> that we're seeing on this trip, so you have to find somewhere else. So I spent the entire journey sleeping on the bench up on the deck, which was freezing cold, all you know, up the Atlantic, up <laughs> the coast of Africa. But when I arrived in, in Southampton, uh, something very bizarre happened. My suitcase, which was in a huge net, fell out of this net along with other people's belongings. Suitcases crashed into the harbour in Southampton and uh, just sunk, you know. So I literally stood in Southampton with, in the clothes that I, I'd arrived in and um, I looked at this and I thought, well, this is a very auspicious beginning because I must be pretty near the bottom and the only way forward is upwards. Trevor, you must have had a lot of personal drive. You must have felt that um, you were going to get somewhere. Bizarrely, it's always been with me as a child. I just felt that I had something to give. I mean, a little kid from District 6 wanting to write feature f m music for international films is a m mad dream. And for some reason, I always felt that, that it was totally possible. I didn't for one instant doubt that I would write major scores for major pictures. It's a huge step uh, in distance and culture from District 6 to Regent's Park and the Royal Academy of Music. But Trevor immersed himself in this totally new world. It was 1967, he was 17. Trevor excelled in the Academy's multinational surroundings. But his scholarship money only lasted the first year. So while he had the talent, he still needed to pay his way. So I did odd jobs and, uh, you know, whatever I was going, washing dishes in Soho, uh, in various restaurants. And not very good for the hands. Not terribly good for the hands, especially as I, I had to put in a lot of hours of practicing and you had split ends and the winters seemed to be colder in the <laughs> 60s than they are now. And uh, so, yes, it was, it, you know, it was 
character building. Today, Trevor spends his time between a farm in Suffolk and his home in London, with its studio in the basement. Together with his wife, Victoria, and their four children, he's created a very different life. It's inconceivable what he went through being a non-white South African. The South African authorities withdrew my passport. I had no... I became stateless. So I've always slightly felt um, not rooted uh, after I left Cape Town. Whether it's the full symphony orchestra or a simple piano, Trevor has an instinctive empathy for the image. It was his time at the National Film and Television School that made him a viable film composer. His first short film there won an Oscar. Suddenly, Trevor found himself in great demand. And the game is on. It's the most petrifying thing imaginable because the fact that you win an Oscar at that age is very scary because you do actually realize that you know absolutely nothing. His first big film was Excalibur. After that, there was no turning back. Immortalized by the Beatles, Abbey Road Studios became Trevor's second home and his favorite place to create his music. Now this is the graffiti from just one just month. Just one month. The studio has to be painted every month. And rubbing shoulders with the Fab Four was a daily occurrence. It was the most curious um, sensation of being in the same environment that the Beatles were working. You know, they were in Studio Two, and I. So after a while, you know, my nervousness subsided, and I was able to focus on what I was here to do, which is to to make music. It's a fantastic room. The acoustic is magical. I think it has about three seconds, 3.5 seconds dying away of the sound. One of the tunes that came out of this room. She's somebody who I'm sure believes in yesterday. I lost so much leaving South Africa, but I gained so much in being here. And now I feel it's about time I put back what what I've gained, you know, so it's, I've gone full circle in a sense. Trevor's initiated an annual scholarship for South African students excelling in music to come and live, work and learn in London. I'd love to put back into the, the pot of fate what it very generously gave me. And I think, you know, a scholarship changes the fate of a human being, you know. It certainly changed Trevor's fate from a shy, stammering schoolboy He's now one of the world's top five film composers. Yet still he finds it hard to look back at what was his life. My whole life is about selling emotion. I, I write music with emotion and it's dealing with feelings objectively. And I think I've avoided most of my life dealing with subjective feelings, my feelings. Um, I didn't know whether I'll ever be able to face it, actually, because it's such a long journey from where I came from to working in Hollywood. I'm thinking of this um, young boy uh, leaving Cape Town Harbour, Table Mountain in the background. Uh, his luggage gets dropped into the sea in Southampton, and he becomes one of the top composers for films in the world. Surely that's a film in itself. I suppose, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to score it though, if it's, if it's going. <laughs> That's all for today's video. Next, we'll look more at a interview with Trevor Jones, as I said, that is featured in the Dark Crystal Deluxe vinyl soundtrack and that you can find online and in an old, old 80s magazine. So until next time, keep exploring Thrawn.